Um, our speakers this morning for the opening discussion <coughs> hardly need introduction. Ambassador Hambly and Secretary General Morris have spent uh, so many years, including this year, traveling around the Middle East. So what they're bringing to us is uh, uh, both fresh and deep in experience. And I'll now turn it over to them. Th thank you very much, Paul, for your kind words. Um, William and I this morning are going to talk about, about aspects of the Middle East changing political, uh, political geopolitics and dynamics. Uh, William will start out with giving an overview of, of some of the real uh, interesting uh, developments that are taking place with Iran particularly and happening with Turkey's new involvement, and perhaps what the Russians are doing too. Then I'll focus a bit on, on one country that's of great interest at the moment, namely Saudi Arabia, because we have the visit, of course, of, of Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman bin Abdulaziz bin, Abdul, bin Faisal bin Turki bin uh, Abdullah bin Mohammed ibn Saud. So, William, why don't you start? Okay. Yeah, well, let me see. Um, let's talk a bit about Iran. I, I get quite close to a guy called Ayatollah Safavi, who is the foreign policy advisor to the Supreme Leader, and I've dealt with him for decades. And the Iranians have a different perspective on the world. For a start, they don't behave like we behave. So they plan strategically. They will make their plans strategically. So they have committees. They will appoint people who are responsible for areas. So, for example, Ayatollah Safavi is responsible for Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Bahrain. Uh, but they have different people responsible for different regions. They have committees they report to. And it's uh, a strategic long view. So 20 years they plan their foreign affairs, 20-year plans right ahead, working on what they want to do, where they want to be, how they want to do it, what we're going to achieve, they think. Now, how about us in the West? Something happens, we react. Something happens, we react. We have zero vision, no long-term planning. We are puppy dogs that get very much pushed around sometimes when it comes to Middle East affairs. Um, Iran has had a policy of putting up a tough guy against a tough guy, a soft guy against a soft guy. And there w is, there is a school of thought that we need a tough guy against uh, Mr. Trump, but they're moving away from that. They're not entirely so sure that it's necessary. They quite like their existing president. Um, and they, they feel they understand him, Trump. The Iranians feel they understand Donald Trump because they've had their own Donald Trump in Ahmadinejad. So they understand the phenomena Exactly, and they can relate to it. They don't like it at all, uh, but they can relate to it. Of course, um, these issues are difficult for the Iranians uh, when it comes to the United States of America because we don't allow them here, not really, even under Obama. I mean, a guy like Ayatollah Safi is not going to get a visa to come here to talk at Paul Rich's conference. It's just impossible. The State Department would be scared witless of the possible consequences. The possible consequences, you just talk to somebody. I mean, what's the big deal? But, um, but we have this habit. It's not unique to America, believe me. The British, everybody does this kind of thing and makes things slightly difficult. Um, and then we are dealing in a position of semi-ignorance with experts that, that really don't know what's going on. But, and another word or two about Iran to understand Iran. I mean, Syria is hugely important to Iran. The Alawites matter, the whole Syrian situation matter. They realize they're rogue Muslims. They're, you know, I mean, they're not real 
the Alawites, not they you know, believe in reincarnation, for goodness sake, and they have their very eclectic religion, uh, you know, the Alawite faith. They, have, they celebrate Passover as well as Christmas, as well as... No, sorry, they don't celebrate Christmas. They celebrate Passover, Easter, Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha, and Ashura. You get lots of holidays. And, uh, but the Alawite faith is not exactly real Muslim, but the, the Iranians have taken them under their wing because the Alawites have a big... Ali is a big deal for the Alawites. So because they put such immense emphasis on Ali, they've got to take them in as little brothers and they're absorbed. Um, they, um, and they really care about their hegemony in Syria. But the attitude to Iraq is slightly different. If you're talking about an Iranian religious thinker, um, Iraq is... is well, it's where Hussein died. Hussein, um, we, you know, our sacrifice. Hussein, the great, he died in Iraq. The ground is soaked in blood. And will there ever be peace in Iraq? I doubt it. It would be good if it happened, but I, you know, I mean, that's the kind of attitude to Iraq by an Iranian religious thinker. So it's different perspective. Okay, I, I could go on, but we, uh, we want to have time for questions. I'm going to move to another issue. I'm going to raise one other issue uh, so that we can then, Ambassador Hamney will talk to you. And then I want to talk about Afrin, the Turks, and northern Syria, and what's going on at this moment. Because it breaks my heart, actually. Um, we have these forces, the SDF, that fought with us. For us, for us, the West, to fight on the ground against Daesh. We didn't fight on the ground against Daesh. What are the SDF? They're predominantly the PYD, the Kurdish forces. PYD, PYJ. PYD is the, is the boys and PYJ is the girls. They have female fighting units as well. Um, they're very good. It was the first time we really saw people... Uh, taking prisoners uh, are unique because, as you know, in civil wars and wars of this kind, people never take prisoners. The opposition, the government, they just kill all the prisoners. And it's one of the problems because then people have to fight to the death because they know being taken prisoners means death. The, um, so the PYD, our boys in Syria who fought for us and died for us to remove Daesh. Um, as you all know, Turkey has invaded, moved into northern Syria because it does not want a resurgent Kurdish area in northern Syria with some form of autonomy. Um, and it's been quite ruthless. And uh, they came in they came in, they, they've now taken pretty much Afrin and the villages round about. Um, and um, they, the first thing they did when they got to the center of the city was pull down the statue of Kawa the blacksmith. That was pulled down a few days ago. Kawa the blacksmith is, um, is a Kurdish uh, mythic, mythical hero who, uh, it's a sweet story. I mean, it, it, there was a king called Dahik who had two great snakes growing out of his shoulders, black snakes. Uh, anyway, he was a very nasty little king that ruled Mesopotamia between the land of the Tigris and the Euphrates. And he used to eat the blood of children. Anyway, so Kawa, the blacksmith, that had some of his children taken because he lived in the village. And uh, Dahik lived in a big castle carved in the rock in the Zagros Mountains. And... Um, he, he had had some of his children taken. His last daughter was about to be taken. And he substituted uh, the blood of a lamb for the blood of his child and took it up to the castle. And so uh, this was great because they didn't notice the difference, the snakes. And then so everybody started doing the same thing. And the children were sent up into the mountains and so slowly became uh, an army of Peshmerga, ready to die. The word Peshmerga means ready to die. 
and Kawa the blacksmith went up there with them and then taught them and led them. And they all came down. And when they grew up to, to manhood, womanhood, the men, young men and women came down and destroyed Dahik and chopped his head off and so on. And, and springtime came. And a couple of days ago, they light bonfires all through, uh, through Iraq and, the, the, and indeed Iran and the Kurdish areas to celebrate the victory of Kawa, the blacksmith, uh, and the coming of spring. And, uh, you know. Anyway, the point being that um, the first thing the Turks did when they came in was to pull down, you know, rather like pulling down Saddam's statue, which we did in Baghdad, they pulled down Kawa, the blacksmith's statue. Um, and I'm in close contact, close-ish contact with the, um, the, P the PYD, PYJ fighters, and they're saying, so I'll just finish with what they have to say to me in the, in the emails they're sending. Um, and I can't verify any of this except for the statements about the looting, because you can see that for yourself on YouTube. The, pictures of the looting that's going on is, are up there. But um, they're, they're emptying our homes, uh, carrying away our cars, looting the shops and factories. And hundred, hundreds of us, because now the bombing has stopped now. So now, and all the people fled from the bombing, emptied the city. Now they're outside, they want to go home to their homes, which are being looted. Um, Hundreds of us in cars are waiting at checkpoints without hope, hoping to go home to salvage our homes. And now the Turkish bombing has stopped, but the Turks won't let us in. Uh, people are starving in areas like Zahra and Zarat. Um, the Yazidi and Fakira are still being attacked and bombed by the Turks because they're non-Muslim. Mine clearance teams are needed to deal with the unexploded bombs now in, in the city. Uh, we, this is the sort of elders, Council of Elders, we are willing to put pressure on the YPD to break uh, with the PKK in Turkey uh, to save the, the, those on the east bank of the Euphrates from the rest of the Turkish onslaught. Um, and uh, the YPG and YPJ units in Raga Bulbul and, and Khalil village, where they've retreated to, are ready to surrender. They can't. They have to fight to the death. They're ready to surrender, uh, but they're, they're frightened of the, the alliance of the Free Syrian Army, the Daesh, and the Turks that are coming against them. Daesh, you understand, this is a Kurdish perspective. They regard themselves as facing Daesh fighters uh, allied with the Turks. And uh, they regard, I mean, with Kurdish perspective, Kurdish-Syrian perspective, they, they believe that many of the, the Daesh people now are, are with Turkey and Erdogan is sort of the new inheritor of the, the, the mantle as the caliph. But this is a Kurdish perspective. Well, how much credibility you give to it is up to you. But I'm just saying, these people fought and died for us, fought and died for America in the fight against Daesh, and now they are being slaughtered big time in northern Syria. So I think we have a certain responsibility. We need to think about that responsibility. Um, thank you. That's it. We'll turn over to Mark Hamley. Let's focus for a minute on a country which is very much in the news at the moment, namely Saudi Arabia. First, I think it's always helpful to have a little bit of a, a focus about the country we've talked about. Saudi Arabia is a massive place, size of Alaska and Texas at 830,000 square miles. Um, it occupies almost two-thirds of the Arabian Peninsula. Population, 28 million people, 80% of which are, are Sunnis, 20% are Shia, largely over here in the eastern province where, where a lot of the oil is. Um, you have 25% are foreign workers, large from South Asia, but you also have 40,000 Americans. And 75% 75 
75% are under 35 years of age, including the current crown prince. But Saudi Arabia has always been a country where for the uh, for last several decades, since the time of King Abdulaziz, it's always been a country which had a lot of stability. Um, Abdulaziz told his sons upon his deathbed that the transition should be from eldest son passing through the, his, uh, his many, many progeny. Um, and if you found it wasn't good, pass him over. They did that twice. Saud became the first king and was then asked to leave in 1963 when he was bankrupting the country. And then you had, after Faisal was assassinated in 1975, Prince Mohammed was supposed to take over, but he was Mohammed of the Two Evils. Remember the princess story where he, an adulterous member of the family, uh, her love affair was quite a story back in the 1970s. He had her stoned to death, and he also drank, and that was not assumed to be good. So he became head of the family, but passed over to King Khalid, who was a wonderful king, then to Fahad, first of the Sideri Seven, and then to Abdullah, and then to King Salman. And King Salman is actually an interesting man. We talk about change in Saudi Arabia as being, um, as being a, uh, uh, the, the ruler of the, of the kingdom. That's not the case. The king has all the power in Saudi Arabia, King Salman. And since the death of, of Saudi Arabia, we see all these things which have happened. Uh, the Saudi foreign policy was, uh, in, in, used to always be very stable. We only had three foreign ministers. Uh, the first was Faisal himself, became foreign minister at age 20, 26 in 1930, and re was foreign minister until his death in 1975, following a two-year interlude. During Saud, for two years, he was not foreign minister. Then you had his son, Saud, was, was uh, foreign minister until his death in 2015. Now, Adil Jaber is now the foreign minister, which always had stability. Um, they're always very cautious in the way they, they approach things. But all this changed in January 2015 when King Abdul bin Abdulaziz, uh, bless him, uh, passed away and Salman took over. But Salman was eminently prepared to be king. Um, although he's viewed as being, uh, being, being ailing and, and, and somewhat frail, actually, I think it's quite the contrary. He was a close advisor to his son, King Fahad. He ruled in Riyadh the province for over 40 years as a key, key position in the government. He was also family disciplinarian. So anyone in the family, thousands of princes, anyone had problems for, for either moral behavior or because of, of, of drink or because of financial impropriety, they all were sent to him for, for discipline. Some were sent to jail, some were placed under house arrest. So he knows where all the, all the, uh, all the, the, the skeletons lie in that huge family. And he also became defense minister following the death of another full brother, Sultan, was very close to it. Yet another foreign brother, brother Nayef, in fact, appointed Nayef's son, Crown Prince, uh, uh, after uh, Mukran, who was his brother, was uh, Crown Prince, appointed him Crown Prince too. And what we're seeing now is, is that King Salman, in my view, is viewing the kingdom as being, they have to change the way they, they practice things. We're seeing the, the creation of the fourth Saudi kingdom. Uh, the first Saudi kingdom was in 1756, at the time we had George Washington chasing after uh, the French and Indians and during that, that war uh, back in the 18th century. We had Muhammad ibn Saud and Muhammad Abdul Wahhab who went and created what was the first Saudi kingdom, most of the peninsula, brought Wahhabism into, into gutter and tried to get other places, but largely in those two places where it remains to this day. And then you had them kicked out by the Turks. There's another small kingdom came in the 1840s, was also displaced, and then in, in the early part of the 20th century, Abdulaziz formed this, this fabulous story of creating Saudi Arabia. But when Salman became king, in a situation where you had a burgeoning population, the population, frankly, was uh, difficult in that you had about 40% unemployment or underemployment of the key workforce between, between 18 and 30 years of age. Uh, you had uh, you know, jobs mostly by, <coughs> being done by foreign people by foreign workers, um, so it was a very difficult situation. The oil price was, was uh, taken down, downward spiral. Things had to change, and he used this instrument, his son, Muhammad. Muhammad had a very close relationship with his father, has about 14 siblings, but why was he picked? Muhammad was with his father when he had a stroke. And in that relationship, when his father couldn't, couldn't speak, Muhammad spoke for him. When Muhammad had, when Salman couldn't write, Mohammed bin Salman wrote for him. So it was a very close relationship with father and son. Uh, and of course, the families are very important in the kingdom. You have, you have three wives, 
Most of his famous uh, progeny are Sultan, the first astronaut, and others who are deputy minister of, of oil. They're all from the first wife who passed away. Second wife only had one son. And his third wife, he has uh, several sons, and Muhammad being the oldest of those. So what we're seeing then is um, extraordinary things happening during the first six months, very, very contrary to the way business was done in Saudi Arabia earlier. In April 2015, Crown Prince Mokran, who was the, the uh, youngest son of King Abdulaziz, was replaced as Crown Prince by Muhammad bin Nayef. This was viewed as being a positive move by the West, because Muhammad bin Nayef was, was a, a darling of the West. He was a very, very critical person in terms of the counterterrorism, son of Prince Nayef, ran the interior ministry very effectively. But Mohammed bin Salman was placed in position of deputy crown prince. But at this time, the also significant power started to gravitate towards Mohammed bin Salman, particularly the, the economic and, and, uh, and social areas of the government. He was also defense minister, so he controlled that as well. The Mutawa, the religious police in, in Saudi Arabia, had their powers curtailed. Um, there was liberalization of that. The head of the organization had also been removed by Abdullah before. So uh, Mohammed bin Salman promised new openness, promised that the kingdom would become a new place, a new order of business. Meanwhile, for reasons uh, which, which perplexed Washington, we only had three hours notice. In March of 2015, he launched a hot war against, against Yemen while maintaining a very, very stringent Cold War against, uh, against Iran, a war of words against Iran. And we'll talk about both those a little bit later. But over the past year, the excitement has continued. In June of 2017, Mohammed bin Nayef was removed as crown prince. Mohammed bin Salman took over that job. Uh, that was something, again, very extraordinary. Um, the same month, Saudi Arabia joined by Egypt, uh, UAE and Bahrain broke relations with Qatar, one of the six members of the Gulf Cooperation Council. That was unheard of. Generally, these issues are always handled very quietly behind the scenes, but there had been a, a growing difficulty with Qatar. We'll talk about it in a minute. But it was a, uh, a seminal move in, in the Middle East when that happened. In October, Vision 2030 came out. This was a, a way which Mohammed bin Salman said, we're going to change the way Saudi Arabia runs itself. We're no longer going to be dependent solely on oil. We're going to create a whole new infrastructure, a whole new business business outlook, which will employ our population in meaningful ways and carry us into the 21st century, not having to rely so much on, on oil. 5% uh, of Saudi Aramco was supposed to be sold. Um, this has now been, been changed quite a bit. Uh, it was going to probably give a trillion dollars worth or more of income from that. That recently has been announced as going to be, be much more progressive change. That will not happen quite as quickly. A general entertainment authority was created. This was extraordinary because in, up until then, you couldn't have concerts in the kingdom. There are no cinemas, although many malls have been built with cinemas sort of closed off, but now they can open up as full-fledged cinemas uh, shortly. Um, well, women were given the ability to drive. That was another, the only country where women could not drive. Um, and then in November 2017, uh, a very interesting development, about 320 notables in Saudi Arabia were, were arrested. Um, and detained, in, most of them in the, in the uh, Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Riyadh, which only a month earlier hosted most of the leading uh, business people from the U.S. and Europe in terms of promoting Vision 2030. But now this was a place of jail for these 320 people, including 11 princes, including as well three sons of, of Abdullah, uh, led by Mut'ab, the head of the National Guard, um, the former governor of Medina, the former governor of of Riyadh, who were all in, pris in prison, along with the General Ali Kahtani, who was uh, Prince Turkey bin Abdullah's uh, key advisor. He apparently died in, in this prison, the only, only person we know who died. Also the son of, of King Fahad, one of his favorite sons, Abdulaziz, also disappeared, was not taken to the Ritz Carlton, but he has disappeared from sight, is uh, reported to have been killed, but the Ministry of Interior said, no, he's alive, but that's all we know about him. And then also the same month, there was a strange saga about Saad al-Hariri. Didn't know what happened with, to Saad al-Hariri. That's a, a Lebanon, but it was viewed to be an issue of involving uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, growing concern about Iran it's, and Hezbollah in a way to try to get Lebanon to change positions on that, and perhaps to draw U.S. and Israel into some kind of confrontation. In February 2018, we had a sudden sacking of most of the key military people in the kingdom, the chief of general staff, the head of the land and air forces, and the missile force, all replaced. And the first female vice minister was announced. On the other hand, uh, 
with promises it will be future probably female ministers. Women are also allowed to join the armed forces. These are all very revolutionary in terms of Saudi Arabia. And it's a very, very key thing. Then in March, uh, Mohammed bin Salam left the kingdom. You don't leave a kingdom unless you are confident you're going to have a place to come back. So many people, you know, Khalifa left Qatar, was replaced. Uh, you know, you normally stay in your, in your country unless uh, you're very confident you have things under control. He went first to Egypt and to Britain, and now is on a three-week visit to the United States of America. So he's very confident that things are in control. Why? Because his father is there. His father supports him completely. But there is a generational split in Saudi Arabia. Many amongst the royals, those 11 who were arrested, some of the key members of the family, key members of the business community, including uh, Bakr bin Laden, uh, Kamal Ibrahim, many of the key, uh, key people, senior people, were all amongst those who were arrested allegedly on corruption basis, which is very popular with, the, with uh, young people particularly. But I think Frank was a way in order to, to, uh, to tell people that you are a potential threat to me and that we're going to make sure that there's no issue of possible revolt in the future. So they have been had their, their wings clipped. Um, but most younger Saudis you talk to, remembering that 75% or 35, strongly support Mohammed bin Salman. They believe in his vision. They like the way he's the only royal that tweets like they do. Saudi Arabia tweets more than any other country pretty much, but it's, it's quite an extraordinary uh, event. Where does the U.S. come in on, on this? Why, why is Saudi Arabia so important to us? Why was Mohammed bin Salman given such a, such a warm welcome in Washington? Well, our relations with Saudi, with Saudi Arabia are indeed quite special. We go back to February of 1945 in the USS Quincy. We have FDR and Abdulaziz talking with, with William Eddy translating on an extraordinary visit just following Yalta. And on this cruiser in the Great Bitter Lake in the Suez Canal, they had this meeting. And they, they clicked. These two men really clicked. Um, Roosevelt seated in his wheelchair, Abdulaziz came in, very, very hindered by, by, by arthritis, walking very crippled over, many of us can appreciate that, and, I, and Roosevelt allegedly told him, I'm so sorry, Your Majesty, I should stand to greet you, but I can't. And Abdulaziz Malay sat down, had a talk, and when they left, uh, Roosevelt had two wheelchairs, gave one to Abdulaziz, and also gave him a DC-3 and a crew to fly around his huge kingdom. Well, someone heard about this, namely Winston Churchill, who'd been at Yalta. So what's this Americans doing that, poaching our place in Saudi Arabia? So he met with, uh, with Abdulaziz on, on Lake Fayoum in, in Egypt, and uh, he didn't have anything to give to, to handy, so he gave him a nice encrusted uh, sword, you know, so we could do this king. The king had lots of swords that Arabia ever has daggers and things. But also, I can give you also some of the best motor car in the world when I get back, and some a beautiful, beautiful, uh, um, blue shadow, white shadow, Rolls Royce, beautiful car, but it was a right-hand drive car. In Arabia, like America, you drive left-hand drive, and the ruler always sits next to the driver. So it was never used in Saudi Arabia, never used by Abu Aziz, and this day sits. Originally, oil was our leading interest. Uh, Southern California's granted a Saudi concession, became a Ramco. Um, the Saudis appreciate the fact that we had no colonies. That's one reason why, upon his deathbed, he told his sons, trust the United States. They're a, a, uh, a good country to work with. Um, we also were granted position, uh, permission to open a base in Dahran, which was something the British wanted, but the British couldn't get. Other reasons, historically, we've been close to the Saudis. They were, of course, the leader of the Islamic world. Um, they were partnered against the against USSR, particularly in Afghanistan. And recently, again, our counterterrorism efforts, Mom bin, bin Naif was very strong on that, as I indicated earlier. 14th largest economy in the world, a major, major uh, 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 source for US, U.S. goods and services, and particularly of U.S. Uh, arms at the moment. There are 111,000 Saudis studying in the United States for U.S. University. That's $3.4 billion annually they contribute to our economy. And there are 40,000 American citizens working in the kingdom. Our Trump relations have been improving. Until 2017, the Saudis were very upset with U.S. positions. As Obama was viewed either as being neither engaged nor particularly helpful, particularly on, on Syria, where they didn't see us uh, doing enough to remove Assad from power, on, on Iran, where they thought we were very weak kneed very concerned about Iran. They did not like the, the, uh, uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action at all. Um, so they're very relieved by Trump's election. And it's been certainly suggested by multiple visits exchanged between both countries. 
uh, Gerard Kushner has a special bedroom set aside for him in the palace in, in Riyadh. And uh, of course, the new ambassador in Washington is the 29-year-old full brother of Mohammed bin Salman Khalid. That's a picture of So under Trump, there's been much more of a convergence of views. On Iraq, Iraq's always been of concern with us. In the past, Saudi Arabia under Abdullah was, was quite uh, supportive of, of Sunni groups which were attacking our forces. Under, uh, on Iraq, Mohammed bin Salman has really taken a very different view. He invited Muqtadr al-Sadr, a leading, leading Shiite, to Riyadh, and other, Abdul Hakim as well, I think, has come down to, um, uh, to Riyadh, uh, particularly in Basra, which is a key oil-producing area, a bit disenchanted because Baghdad didn't pay them much attention. Um, they may want to have an autonomy zone as they have up in the Kurdish region up north. They're going to help them uh, develop the petrochemical plant down there. They've opened a consulate in Basra. Uh, the, the Iranians have, uh, and Shalamchak over here, have a free trade zone, which attracts a lot of Iraqis for goods and, and much needed foreign exchange. Iran does not like the size moving in like this. They may uh, re reopen the uh, Trans-Arabian Pipeline from Iraq to the Red Sea. So these are all projects which uh, could be very helpful in the future with Iraq. We're very pleased with that. On Iran, of course, oral history impacts countries in the Middle East a lot more than our own country. And part of the oral history is, is re recalling the Persian invasion centuries ago, the Arabian Peninsula. And so historic wars between, uh, um, between uh, uh, Arabs and Iran is something which is very much ingrained in not just uh, uh, Saudi history, but in Gulf history, but also even in Iraq. Remember when Saddam invaded Iran in 1980, tried to take advantage of the chaos in that country, a very uh, ill-considered move on his part. It was called the Seed of Saddam, the Holy War of Saddam, in order to remove the, 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 the Shiite uh, apostasy in their, in their view. The Iranian uh, 1979 revolution threatened Saudis greatly. 1979 also was the time of the Grand Mosque episode where you had Sunni extremists take over the mosque for over two weeks and threatened the kingdom uh, very badly at that point. There's a movie coming out about that uh, next year, which should be quite in interesting. Uh, full support of Mohammed Salman in producing that, so they've talked to everybody that's left from that uprising. But after, uh, after uh, Khomeini took over in Iran, suddenly you had a new title for the king of Saudi Arabia. It was just the king of Saudi Arabia. He was also the custodian of the two holy mosques. So that's King Salman, that's his most important job he has. But regional policy has always been conditioned by the, by the Shia threat. It's been intensified by the fall of Saddam. Saddam was a big bulwark against Iran when he collapsed. They did not want us to go into, into Iraq because of this. Suddenly there's no major power that could contain Iran. And they saw Iran sweeping into Iraq, concerned about Syria, as, as William indicated, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and then in Yemen, the Houthis, they consider to be uh, Syrian uh, prawns. And of course, this joint, uh, joint conference plan of action is strongly opposed because they say it does not do anything to curtail Iran's uh, uh, bad uh, influences. So Yemen, rock history for decades with Yemen, uh, war in the 1930s. I took these provinces up here, Asir, Najran, Jizan, away from Yemen and gave them to Saudi Arabia. Um, so there's always a, a lingering uh, Irredentist movement, which has sort of been solved at the moment. Uh, but in the 1960s, civil war came. The Saudis supported the royalists. Uh, 1970s, then they started to interfere in policy and chose the leaders, successive leaders of, of, of Yemen, particularly Abdul Saleh in 1979. Um, and they played politics quite a bit. And they also started sending down missionaries because they saw the Houthis, who, who the, they thought the Zaydis, who were the, uh, the, the were an offshoot of, of Shia, Shia Islam? They they thought they were perhaps um, they might be able to influence them by bringing down missionaries. So a lot of missionaries came down and basically bought their way into fortune. Got, got a lot of supporters, and then you had in the late 1980s, early 90s, you had a, a very renowned Zaidi cleric named Badr al Houthi, uh, Sheikh Badr al Houthi, who said, you know, Zaidi traditions are very strong in Yemen and they're much more progressive frankly, than Wahhabi, we really should, should re-inculcate, reintroduce our people to Zaidi culture and tradition. And that began the Houthi movement, taken over by his son Hussein, who was, was killed in an early conflict in 2000, and then later um, by Abdul Malik al-Houthi. And, and then after the Arab Spring, you had a situation where, where a 
proposal was made to make federated Yemen. The Houthis were given a very bad deal, no outlet to the sea, very contained just up here. So they took over Sana'a and then took over the government. And then you had March 2015, you had on the pretext of, of that, a, a call from the President Hadi, who was by that time in Riyadh, to, um, to invade. And so they declared a, an armed uh, an air war against Yemen, which come to a, into a land war. And here you have most of these areas are now either al-Qaeda over here or non-Houthi areas. The Houthis though still control all the populated areas. And that is a war still without end and is, a, is something which we have to do something about. The Iranian threat finding is quite spurious, but it's become a, a self-fulfilled prophecy. Over 10,000 civilians have been killed. There's a massive humanitarian crisis. Now, there's no end game in sight, but the loyalists do have the advantage. And of course, for us, the problem of Al-Qaeda still remains. The reason we were always engaged in Yemen was not for humanitarian reasons, always to, to banish Al-Qaeda, which we have not been successful, but we're continuing to work on that. Then there's a situation with Gutter. Gutter is always boxed above its weight. Um, its unhappy neighbors never been able quite to swat away what they saw is, is their uh, uh, perceived aggravations. Al Jazeera, which we promoted as being a, a really free, good uh, news service, and in, in the early 1990s, um, Frank did different things in Arabic than in English, but they attacked governments in ways which were not accepted as being a good policy amongst friends and neighbors. Of, and, and so the UAE, Egypt, and Saudi in particular did not like Al Jazeera. The Iranian uh, problem has always been, the Doha has always maintained, uh, always maintained uh, relations with, um, with Iran, which like Oman is, was not appreciated. They weren't playing to the same team, and they also accused it of supporting terrorism. It's a little by calling the kettle black in some ways, but indeed, Gutter particularly has been very supportive of the Muslim Brotherhood, who regards a terrorist group by Egypt uh, and UAE particularly. I don't think Saudi Arabia has ever declared them a terrorist group. Um, but you have Yusuf al-Qaradawi, the leading cleric of the Muslim Brotherhood, he's an ancient man now, uh, has always lived in Doha. Um, is a dreadful personality, frankly. He sponsored fatwas against the U.S. It's okay to kill U.S. troops in Iraq. Um, he's done some nasty things. Very, very important in Egypt. You remember after the Arab Spring, when Mubarak fell, the last, the major, um, um, last big gathering in, in, in Medan Tahrir to celebrate that occasion. It was not Irian, the young man from Facebook that really promoted the revolution. It was Yusuf al-Qaeda who came and spoke to the masses. The Muslim brothers jumped into that with all their organization and really then got Morsi and his president, supported by, by Gutter, opposed by UAE particularly. But that has been a situation which has been very, very difficult. Trump has basically endorsed uh, Saudi moves against Gutter. Tillerson prevaricated a bit. He, he tried to promote, um, when he was Secretary of State, a better relationship and it has gone on. We have major interests in Doha with the, the natural gas, which uh, uh, Exxon Mobil. And of course, our huge base, can't see for this map down there, but the gutter's in there. Uh, Odate, our most important base in the Middle East is there. And so we've tried to balance things, but not too successfully. Some final thoughts, uh, what should be done and what's being done are probably a contradiction in terms, that, in terms of current US policy. We should be tough on Iran, no doubt, but not provoke her unnecessarily. I think with the appointment yesterday of Bolton as national security advisor and the the nomination of Mike Pompeo to uh, Secretary, of, Secretary of State uh, will probably make it likely that, that in May we will see the U.S. back off from the, from the Joint Cooperation Agreement, uh, which I think would be a mistake, but nonetheless, I think that probably is going to be in the cards. We should find a way to actively promote an end to the war in Yemen. One problem with that war is that originally it was just Saudi aggression, then it became Saudi-American aggression, and now, frankly, it is... Uh, Radio Sana'a recently has been talking about being the Saudis merely being pawns of Anglo-American aggression against Yemen. So it's very difficult for us to take a lead, but we certainly can use, use our good influence to find a way to promote, promote a, a, some kind of a reconciliation between uh, Yemen and Saudi Arabia. And that is something that has to be done. Similarly, we need to find new openings on Syria and define our policy on Turkey. As Wim indicated, there's going to be a confrontation soon between ourselves and the Turks, unless we withdraw our 2,000 troops who are in Syria at the moment. But we should fill empty diplomatic posts as well. Uh, we can't conduct diplomas without diplomats. Um, you may have the age of the internet, 
but it's not done that way. We have no ambassador in, in Riyadh and no ambassador in Doha. Um, so it's very difficult for us to, to, uh, to implement policy in an effective way. So in short, we should exercise uh, thoughtful leadership and less grandstanding to protect both our interests and those of our friends and allies in the region. So on that note, let's stop and maybe take some questions, okay? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, uh, <clears throat> inevitably, when uh, Mark and I see each other, we go back decades to uh, when we were both in Qatar, and we never anticipated that the problems would still be here. But uh, <clears throat> this is the 26th year for the uh, Middle East Digest. <coughs> and uh, we, uh, when we started it, we uh, thought we'd be discussing other things, but we're still discussing the same things. Uh, I think we have time for questions now. Uh, what time do we have right now? We have 15 minutes, and um, if you have questions, why don't you grab the mic? I'll give it to you. Any questions? I'm going to give you the mic. And, uh, yeah, my name is Mohammed Ahmed. I uh, have worked for the United Nations for a number of years, and I worked as a professor at Baghdad University, and I have been retired, I mean, here in this country since 94, uh, and I've been following, I mean, the Middle East issues, and my particular thanks to uh, uh, Professor Ambassador uh, Morrison, and uh, for shedding light, I mean, on the Kurdish issue in uh, Syria, for which I'm going to, to elaborate later on in my uh, panel. And uh, uh, I would like to, to raise the issue. I mean, the title of your presentation is uh, Dynamics of the Changing Middle East. We are saying and seeing that Iran is going very aggressively from Tehran to Baghdad to Damascus to uh, Beirut. And we have only 2,000 uh, soldiers on the border in Deir Zur. We are trying to block them to link up, I mean, with, with Syria. But what are we doing, I mean, there? We, it seems to me that we are lost. As you have indicated, that Iran has got very clear cut program, agenda in the Middle East. They know what they are doing, but do we know what we are doing? Thank you. Well, um, the, the situation, uh, it's not all bad news. Let's be just clear about that. There, there, are, there is some good news. I mean, Ambassador Hamley and I were in, uh, on the road to Kirkuk in 2014. We were ambushed by Daesh. I mean, well, well, it was the beginnings of Daesh. They were, they were but elements that were, that would become Daesh, and uh, it was it was quite a scary time. Um, but this, where we were in, uh, we were romping around in, in the end of a plane, uh, time of the Kurdish elect, uh, referendum a month or two ago, and we could drive up. We couldn't get into Bashika because the Turks have invaded and taken that. But we could uh, we could move around to Al Kush, the Christian towns. We could we could move around the Nineveh plain quite safely, just in a car with a friend, without any protection, with nothing, because Daesh is gone. I mean, pretty much it's gone, and uh, so that's a hugely positive outcome. Uh, there are little problems. What do you do with the Daesh women? We put them in prison camps with their children, which is not very tasty. There's one prison camp south of. Cook with 600 women and children there, um, but you know, uh, so this is this is not exactly very nice. What do you do with the widows of the foreign fighters? What do you do with the the Yazidi women coming home who have been raped and now have children? 
and uh, not assimilated very easily back into their societies. So um, there are all sorts of little side problems going on. And how do you rebuild Mosul? I mean, I badmouth the Turks, but uh, they have given, or at least they have pledged. Pledging is not the same as giving. They've pledged $5 billion to Iraq this year, which is the largest pledge we've seen for reconstruction. Um, but uh, the, the, the Kurds uh, are looking to America. Their dream has been shattered because they overreached themselves in that referendum. They're looking to America. Uh, and the Kurds of northern Syria are also looking to America with some justification because they certainly fought for us and they didn't conduct any referendum against our instructions. Um, and what, we've got our 2,000 boys there on the border. Um, and what is our policy? Are we going to, are we going to, uh, we, we're never going to get rid of Bashar al-Assad. That's finished now. That agenda is over, in my view. I'm sorry, there may be others later that have a different perspective. But so, so we, need, we need to try and create some sense of stability. And for that, we need a plan. And you're right, sir, I'm not sure that we do have a plan or a program. Mark, do you want yeah, to? Yeah, I think that is a problem. I don't really think we have a good plan. Uh, in Inserlik, our major base in Turkey, we've withdrawn all of our military aircraft, the A-10s that were there, are very forceful in terms of, of fighting uh, a, a Daesh that were moving them from, from Syria. They've been moved large to Kabul and elsewhere. All we have are refueling planes there. Our relations with Turkey are strained. You know, uh, Erdogan is talking about uh, you know, restoring the, the, uh, the, the false premise of the Treaty of Lausanne, revising that from 1920. You know, we're out of Turk, agreed to this border of Turkey in order to get the, beat the Europeans out of, out of, the Greeks got pushed out of Izmir. But, you know, the map I saw last time I was in Istanbul a couple months ago, people are talking about the map of, of greater Turkey, which cuts across north of Aleppo, takes in Mosul, takes in Kirkuk, and up, up in here is a map of Turkey, which is very popular goes back to what they feel that where Turkey forces were in 1918 when the war ended. They thought that's where Turkey should be. And of course, the, the Kurds have a map which is very different. It goes like that for greater Kurdistan. So there's a lot of continuing problems which will take place. We have no, uh, no recognition of that in the US. I'm afraid these 2,000 forces will be withdrawn. We'll declare victory and go home. Although Daesh is still exists, there are still pockets. They will continue to assassinate people, do car bombs and will re-energize re a population and support them if they don't have, have prospects for the local population in terms of Iraq. Iraq keeps, if the popular mobilization units, the Shiite-run groups, continue to, uh, to dominate in, in the Sunni areas because the occupied force is a big problem. So the elections are important to see what the new government will be like in Iraq and if a body can, can go through in its promise, try and really reintegrate all groups into, into Iraq. That, there's a promise which I don't think will be fulfilled, but something to hope for. Yes, microphone here. Um, hello, um, I'm Ayhan from Berlin Transnational Studies. Um, I had a question to Ambassador. Um, is it um, the comment that Kurds are dying for America too optimistic? Because in a sense, um, YPG or PUID gained uh, a vast majority of territory in Syria. They get uh, financial aid from the United States, specific heavy weapons. Is it not a um, two-side um, based on, two-side uh, relation based on inter their own interests? Because in essence, this is a leftist organization. And in Turkey, for example, many pro YPG um, author question the um, relation of YPG with United States, they argue they, that YPG could, should maybe have a better relation with Ru Russia instead of United States. And secondly, is it also not problematic to report from a war, war zone without any evidence uh, comments like um, Turkey bombs Yazidis because they are not Muslims? Because I could also g um, provide you many reports from Syrian war says exactly the opposite things. And without evidence, I think it will be hard. Thank you. 
very good points. I mean, it is much of what I'm saying is, is hearsay, uh, but there, it is clear that people are, that we have now a new swathe of refugees from northern Syria, um, and there is a problem. I mean, now, as to Turkish culpability and so on, um, there have always been arguments. I mean, there were arguments. Some have said mm -hmm. that the Turks, uh, in the early days, backed Daesh, and you, you've heard this, you know the, the, the conversations that have gone on about this. Um, the, uh, obviously, the YPG are themselves controversial. They're not, uh, not all Syrian Tur sorry, not all Syrian Kurds back the YPG. Indeed, the, uh, there are elements uh, that back the KDP or other groups. There are a myriad of small uh, uh, Kurdish groups, uh, some of whom are much more sophisticated, much more uh, thoughtful and liberal and outlooking. But the YPG and YPJ, these, these are militarized groups um, that are strong and have been strong for some time, and they're there on the ground. Uh, and yes, so when the war against Daesh came up, then the United States, uh, who is policeman of the world, enlisted these people, quite rightly, because they were there, they were ready to fight, they wanted to fight, because their ideology is completely different from that of Daesh, and they, and you're right, they're very leftist, they're very, um, they're not, our natural allies, but they, they certainly fought for us, with us. Um, now, the, the, the situation now, I mean, um, I just, I don't, what they're saying, I want not to be true, which is that uh, ex daesh fighters are going up and fighting alongside Turkey, uh, and that where you'll, where you'll find Daesh now is on the battlefield with Turkey. I want that not to be true. Uh, and I'm sure Turkey will say it is not true, and it's an allegation which may be utter nonsense. I don't know, and I certainly want it not to be true, but it's what they're saying from my friend. They're very frightened, obviously. Uh, now, are the Turks bombing them? The Turks are bombing them. I mean, there's no question about that. Uh, but then we've bombed cities to liberate them. We bombed the hell out of Mosul. All those... You know civilians killed? Civilians were killed. Uh, we bombed the hell out of Mosul. We had to. We couldn't liberate Mosul from Daesh anyway in that. So, so there's a lot of bombing gone on. Um, what to say? I, I, I don't know. Uh, but I'm just telling you what they're saying to me, and they're certainly very desperate at the moment. Very good. Other questions? Please, way in the back. Bring the microphone to you. Like one of those. Actually, I'm going to bring it back to Saudi Arabia. So, the question you mentioned that 75% uh, of youth are in support of MBS right now. About. Um, and I'm wondering, I didn't get, I'm wondering what you have to say about, like, are we not worried about this with his, in a sense, there's a facade of like reform and change and like this new age movement, but at the same time, there's like closure of, you know, political space, or there, a lot of that has been closed, and there's, I, I mean, especially when something like Egypt and UAE are in support of this, the least human rights possible in that area. So I was wondering, like, are we not worried about this? Well, I'm worried about it. I hope, I hope our administration is too. From what you get from the White House, don't seem particularly worried about it. You can always believe the narrative um, that everybody says, but it's quite true that anybody that, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia had the, had the, um, had rec was recognized as one of the most, most uh, prominent twe tweeting countries in the world because men and women couldn't meet. Everybody tweeted. And that's why Mohammed bin Salman was so popular. He's the first royal that really tweeted very, very uh, daily, kind of like uh, others we know in power. Uh, but what's happened since he took over, uh, these people who've been criti critical of him have indeed uh, gone to, been called into the authorities, their Twitter accounts have been shut down, there's a lot more, uh, people are scared. In Saudi Arabia recently, uh, you visit prominent Saudis, you start answering, asking some sensitive questions, uh, and you get, you know, because everybody believes that walls have ears. 
And I think that's probably, there's a, there's a whole view in many, many places in Saudi Arabia that freedom of expression is really being deteriorated. Although you're talking about a more open society coming, we hope that comes, but I think one has to be very, very, very uh, skeptical that it's going to come without some real cost. And I would hope that in our discussions with, uh, with Mohammed bin Salman and his, in our interaction with the Saudi officials that we point out this is an opportunity for you to take advantage as you liberalize, empower women in, in, in place of business and in politics, that you empower them as well to, to critical think and to comment on, on what's going on. If you don't, uh, you know, it's the sort of thing where um, um, Machiavelli ruled the prince, you know, in order to be, uh, in order to be respected, you have to make them fear you. But the corollary to that, he also said, you also have to learn to be loved. And so it's, it's something, it's, it's, it's a very delicate line, but a very good point, and something which is very, consider very considered about. Also, another aspect of that, we want indeed to encourage um, all this investment, but are you going to invest when you suddenly have 230, 300 of your most prominent business people basically give us money, properties have been seized, but any, any course of, 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 of law, due process. Do you want to invest in that sort of situation? It's difficult, yeah. One final question here. Uh, it's kind of a follow up on that question, but uh, I'm concerned that there's one element here that's being uh, overlooked, and that is uh, that uh, these reforms that are being proposed in, in Saudi Arabia um, do not address the question of democracy. And in fact, the suppression of the Muslim Brotherhood done under the pretext that the Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist organization or is too conservative, both of which are dubious when compared to actual Saudi behavior on these two areas in the past. Uh, actually, the real difference between the Muslim Brotherhood and the Saudi position is that the Muslim Brotherhood has some affinity for democracy, how deep it is and how sincere it is. Is, is questionable, but certainly they would favor a republican form of government as opposed to a monarchy in the same way that the Iranians preferred an re Islamic republic over a monarchy. Isn't this something that we should be talking about more? I think that's a very fair, fair comment, but my opinion in terms of Muslim Brotherhood, when they took over in Egypt, you don't have that one election. It was not a particularly fair election. No one was organized for the election when Morsi became a head, but I think people are quite right to think they would not give up power easily. Um, so I think in terms of, of increased democratic values, we tried that in Iran. Bo George Bush wanted to bring democracy to Iran. It's sort of a domino Iran first and then through the Gulf through Iran. It's not going to happen. It has to be in a local cult cultural context. I think the Shura Council is the beginning. Abdullah started that. 20% have to be women to make sure the women feel empowered so they can speak in that council, and make sure the council starts to have real powers, doesn't have any powers at the moment. And so I think this is something they've got to develop at a local level, and I think that will come in time if indeed the vision 2030 pans out. But I think it's awfully ambitious, and I think the, the, the odds are become more regressive rather than progressive. I think that's the real concern. Especially with the Turkey 